The fate of humanity is now in your hands. Hi folks, I'm Ignatius Schnewetsky. And I'm Alex Dowd. Today we're talking about Tomb Raider, starring Alicia Vikander as the video game heroine Lara Croft. Welcome to Film Club. You know, it's movies like this and Warcraft, I'm sure some people would also bring up Assassin's Creed, mm -hmm. um, that really make me nostalgic for the days when crassly commercial attempts to make movie franchises out of video games were just loud and stupid and obnoxious rather than really boring. Yeah. I think it's also the kind, though, that, that, that sort of asks you to examine your sensibilities and say, what do I really prefer? Do mm -hmm. I prefer a kind of junky, silly, stupid blockbuster like the Angelina Jolie Tomb Raider films? Mm -hmm. Or do I prefer something like this, which I think you're right, is very competently made. It's decently shot. The action scenes are legible. It's even well acted, I think, for the most part but is just terminally dull. So we've got uh, Lara Croft, who's been a mainstay of games for 20 years now. Yeah. Usually some kind of archaeologist type figure. Here, just a rich kid. Um, <laughs> I mean, they're trying to give her more of a backstory and a motivation than I think the Angelina Jolie version had. Well, the missing dad thing the, is in that too. Yeah. You know, she's always still daddy issues. Yeah. Essentially. It's, it's really all yeah. about, she's just raiding <laughs> tombs for her dad to find <laughs> everything that's, that's lost in their relationship. Which is weirdly sexist too. I feel like both the movies have it and it's, it's a weird motivation, but. When we came out of this film, you, you said that you were just shocked by how sentimental it was. Yeah which I think is a fair criticism here. Yeah. Um, so Vikander is playing her as a little bit more of a flesh and blood human being, but also yeah. one with motivations that are completely vague. She's right. going to an island because her dad left behind mm -hmm. some tapes and documents, and it takes them a very long time to get to this island. 45 minutes, it's like King Kong or something, you know? <laughs> like we really just have to like, do we need a 40 minute introduction to, look, to, to Lara Croft, you know? And multiple, set pieces in between there. Yeah. There's a bicycle chase. There's another chase with some pickpockets in Hong Kong. Uh, the movie also, uh, it feels the need to do the, this old screenwriting trick where you you sort of, uh, early you take the character low before you can, you know, she can sort of ascend from there. So we get a scene where she's beat up in a boxing ring and also where she uh, fails at a bicycle race. Because we really care <laughs> about the psychology of the character of Lara Croft. So yeah. she travels to this island, which is supposedly the resting place of an ancient Japanese sorceress slash empress with some yeah. kind of death powers. The island isn't very interesting no. to look at. It's a very underexplored environment. Yeah. And we're basically just stalling for time until the actual raiding of the tomb starts. That's a weirdly structured film because once you get there, I also feel like it feels weirdly rushed. It's like you took, you took 40 minutes to get to the island and then the thing is just racing through plot once it gets there. I feel know? like if they, if they ever stop running, they'll just fall asleep in place. That's, <laughs> that's kind of the impression um, that I got. And they, they drop so much of the kind of the conflict or what could be the conflict if this film was trying to do something with its narrative within like the last 15, 20 minutes. Right. It's like, here's some plot for you. This could have been the plot of the film. <laughs> so, I mean, both the, the story and the, the sort of characterization of Croft in this film is borrowed uh, pretty closely from the 2013 reboot of Tomb Raider. It's sort of uh, reimagining her as this sort of green adventurer. She's, you know, she's new at this. It's an origin story. She's not the pistol packing, you know. Uh, but she gets the pistols here at the end. You find out where she... Spoiler! <laughs> <laughs> you do, yeah, you find out where she gets the pistols and we get to see her first wear her hair in a braid. <laughs> that stupid origin story logic. Yeah, but I mean, so I, I think the one thing that I did kind of like about this film is the characterization of Croft, at least in the sense that uh, she's she has vulnerability, mm -hmm. you know? She's a character who feels, f physically feels a lot of the sort of gauntlet she's going through. You mm -hmm. know, we get scenes of her uh, fighting, like a, a sort of a knockdown drag out fight in the mud yeah. at one point. And uh, one of the better set pieces, and then the set pieces are all, again, sort of competently staged, but sort of unimaginable. Without being, without being very tense right. or involving. Right. One of the better ones is her, she's sort of uh, careening down a river and ends up inside this downed plane that's, that's on the edge of this waterfall. And it's basically the trailer scene from The Lost World, but staged 
not as well and with yeah. less suspense. Uh, I did, however, appreciate that this element of uh, sort of constantly putting her in some degree of of physical duress. You know, you, you, this isn't a movie that the, the the Jolie Tomb Raider films. I mean, she might as well have been an android for how much she seemed to emote and how much how much, how vulnerable she seemed in any mm-hmm. moment. This this at least sort of reimagines Croft as a human being. But the that doesn't really help at all with the sense of stakes, right. the sense of danger, which is really, it's its missing here. Yeah. And everything that happens feels so arbitrary. Can't be too careful these days. The world has gone bloody mad. I'll take two. 